on the 12th of August, Indian-born novelist Salman Rushdie was attacked on stage during a lecture in New York. He was repeatedly stabbed in the neck and torso. The attacker was 24-year-old Hadi Mater. Here's the man. Can you get it? Police said they had not established a motive for the attack on the Booker Prize winner. The shocking attack comes 34 years after this. The Satanic Versus was published in September 1988. It was his fourth novel, and it ignited outrage. Many Muslims viewed it as being blasphemous. The novel was banned in many countries with large Muslim populations, including India. A year later, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, then Iran's supreme leader, proclaimed a fatwa, or religious edict, calling upon Muslims to kill the novelist for blasphemy. I refuse to become an unperson. I do not accept that this is, or has ever been, an issue of race relations. This is an issue of religious terrorism. I refuse to forego the right to publish my work or to allow threats and menaces to determine the form in which such work can be published. Was the attack on Rushdie related to the 1989 issued fatwa? Matar, a Shiite Muslim American of Lebanese descent, has pleaded not guilty to charges of attempted murder and assault. His horrific attack on Rushdie serves as a brutal reminder of the threat posed by religious extremism and the enduring impact of fatwas. In the past few decades, jihadi groups have issued fatwas calling for the deaths of Muslims they deem infidels. They incite action through social media, using videos, speeches and statements. They have millions of followers. In June 1992, Egyptian thinker and philosopher Farag Foda was assassinated in front of his son. The liberal writer was accused by Al-Azhar, Egypt's highest Islamic authority, of being an enemy of Islam and an apostate. He was gunned down by members of the Islamic group El Gama El Islamia. When he was asked which of Foda's books he had read, the killer answered, I don't know how to read. Then there was the fatwa issued by Osama bin Laden. The Al-Qaeda leader and four of his associates proclaimed jihad against Jews and crusaders and called for the killing of American civilians in 1998. On September 11th, they carried out the deadliest terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Nearly 3,000 people were killed. On many occasions, fatwas have been issued for the most ridiculous reasons. In India, in 2013, a fatwa was issued by the Grand Mufti of Kashmir, Bashir Uddin Farooqi. He termed singing as un-Islamic, forcing Kashmir's only all-girls rock band to dismantle. In 2015, an Indian Islamic group issued a fatwa against celebrated Iranian filmmaker Majid Majidi and Oscar-winning Indian composer A.R. Rahman over the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad in a film titled Muhammad, the Messenger of God. The film shows the Prophet's life from birth to the age of 13. Mumbai-based Rasa Academy called for the Muslims to reject the film. They said, and we quote, We are against the title. People may use it in a bad manner if they don't like the film, which will mean an insult to the Prophet. Unquote. In response, Rahman, via a Facebook post, said that he composed the music in good faith. The film was eventually released. There's also been a fatwa against drinking coke on women watching football games and believe it or not, a fatwa against vaccines. In August 2018, the Indonesian Ulima Council issued a fatwa declaring the MMR vaccine or vaccines for measles, mumps and rubella as haram, a term used to refer any act that is forbidden by God. 
It claimed that the vaccine contains traces of pork and human cells. Let's understand what the relevance of these fatwas are in Islam, and should it have a place in the modern world? Well, the fatwa remains a core tenet of Islamic lawmaking. Uh, this is a historical institution, if you will, uh, a way in which the believer asks uh, his mufti for a legal opinion on an issue about which there's a lack of clarity or perhaps an issue uh, that represents socioeconomic change or, or change with respect to society as, as that change generally outpaces the law. And this has taken place from the inception of, of Islam and, and carried on throughout the centuries. So the word fatwa means a, a response. In other words, someone asks a question about Islamic law or Islamic ethics or Islamic theology, but mostly about right and wrong, do's and don'ts. Someone asks a question and that questioner is called a mustafti and a scholarly answer to that is called a fatwa. Mr. Rushdie came out at 1045 with the moderator. Um, that was Henry Reese, the co-founder of City Asylum. Um, and uh, people began to applaud. They uh, sat down and then with within 15 seconds, someone jumped into the stage and began to beat him. A uh, male human came and attacked Salman Rushdie. I thought that he was stabbed about six to eight times before they were able to grab a hold of the perpetrator. People jumped onto the stage from the audience to the point where there were probably 20 people on stage pulling the attacker off and keeping him contained. According to reports, the award-winning author is awake and articulate in his conversations with investigators. But he remains hospitalized for severe injuries. Salman Rushdie, نویسنده کتاب آیات شیطانی در نیویورک، این سخنرانی The news of the attack on Salman Rushdie went viral in Iran as well. While there has been no direct established link between accused attacker Hadi Matar and the fatwa, the decree has once again come under scrutiny after the stabbing. Broadcast on Iranian radio in 1989 by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, then Supreme Leader of Iran, the judgment read, and we quote, We are all from Allah, and to Allah we shall return. I'm informing all brave Muslims of the world that the author of the Satanic Verses, a text written, edited and published against Islam, the Prophet of Islam and the Quran, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay, so that no one will dare insult the sacred beliefs of Muslims henceforth. And whoever is killed in this cause will be a martyr, Allah willing. Meanwhile, if someone has access to the author of the book but is incapable of carrying out the execution, he should inform the people so that Rushdie is punished for his actions." Unquote. After it was announced, extremist groups set a multi-million dollar bounty on Rushdie's life. He was forced to go into hiding. The British government placed him under police protection. However, two years after the fatwa was issued, Hitoshi Igarashi, the Japanese translator of the novel, was murdered in 1991. The 44-year-old was stabbed to death at a university near Tokyo, where he had been teaching Islamic culture. No arrests were ever made. The crime remains unsolved to this day. What makes Satanic Verses so controversial? It was the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad um, and it felt that that was a blasphemous depiction of the Prophet, um, a way that, um, that, that did disservice that was offensive to Muslims. What the book has is that the way the book talks about certain personalities of the Prophet Muhammad that Muslims hold in high regard, 
it uses some very uh, colorful and demeaning language that Muslims feel injured by. Also, the term Salman Rushdie uses there to depict the Prophet Muhammad he uses the word mahound, and the mahound is a word that Christians use in order to depict the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace and blessings, in a negative and demeaning manner. And so the kind of colorful language that Rushdi used, many Muslims at the time found that to be, it was demeaning language used against personages that they deemed to be very respectable and who should be dealt with in an honorable manner. Rushdie continued to live in hiding in the UK before moving to the United States in 2000. At the same time, the Iranian government changed its support for the fatwa several times. In 1998, the then president of Iran, Mohammad Khatami, said the regime no longer supported it. But decades later, Rushdie's stabbing is being celebrated by many Iranians. I was very happy to hear the news. Whoever it was, I would like to kiss his hand. I was happy to hear the news that Salman Rushdie had been stabbed. Conservative media in Iran hailed Friday's attack. A state-owned paper claimed the neck of the devil had been cut by a razor. In Pakistan, a spokesman for the Tariq el labaik Pakistan, a party that has staged violent protests against what it deems to be anti-Muslim blasphemy, said Rushdie deserved to be killed. Iran has denied any link with the attack. But the country continues to blame the writer for insulting Islam in his novel. By insulting the sacred matters of Islam and crossing the red lines of more than 1.5 billion Muslims and all followers of the divine religion, Salman Rushdie has exposed himself to the anger and rage of the people. Hadi Matar, the accused, was born and raised in the U.S. But in his ancestral village in Lebanon, many are justifying his actions. Honestly, the stabbing attack against other Salman Rushdie is something to be proud of. Hadi Matar avenged all Muslims. Here's what we know about Rushdie's attacker so far. Matar, 24, is a resident of Fairview, New Jersey, a state neighboring New York. He was born in the United States to Lebanese parents who emigrated from Yarun in southern Lebanon. An analysis of Matar's social media accounts by law enforcement showed him to be sympathetic to Shia extremism and the causes of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, or IRGC, an ideologically driven branch of the Iranian armed forces. The evidence in Matar's cell phone linking him to IRGC suggests that he may have been driven by the fatwa. Matar's parents are believed to be divorced. His father, a shepherd, still lives in Lebanon. Matar's mother has indicated that it is only after her son's trip to Lebanon in 2018 that he became a moody introvert. A potential indoctrination of Matar's in Lebanon could have led to this attack. Many experts believe that people often misinterpret the term fatwa. Fatwa covers a range of issues. It's not merely, um, you know, in, in no way should the fatwa be seen as being commensurate with uh, a ruling on the, the, the welfare of another individual, such as in the case of Salman Rushdie. And this is, I, I would argue, is in fact even a rare occasion in which a fatwa has been issued for that purpose, and it came from the Ayatollah Khomeini, and, and it had to do with the great, you know, authority that he embodied as the Ayatollah in that uh, legal system of Iran that, that gave it such worldwide salience as, as essentially the, the, the head, the, 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 the ruler of Iran. But that, that sense of the fatwa being linked to a death sentence on uh, the author Salman Rushdie is not at all the, the meaning of the fatwa in general. The fatwa can address all the aspects of a believer's life uh, and the changes that, that, that society uh, is undergoing and, and, and cause 
uh, believers to question how best they are to navigate that life, both practically and with respect to ritual and worship. To understand the real meaning of fatwa, one must know where and how it came into being. The fatwa has been available in Islamic culture for more than a thousand years. And there are tons and tons of books from how to do ablutions before you go to prayer, how do you give your annual zakat, your annual charity, to very mundane issues, to very profound issues on which there could be a fatwa. After Salman Rushdie, however, the word fatwa in the Western media in particular meant a death sentence because of the unfortunate way in which Ayatollah Khomeini utilized the word fatwa to say that the author of that book should be, should be killed and then a foundation put uh, several million dollars on his head. So since then, the meaning of the fatwa in the Western uh, uh, media and in the Western world, and as well as in modern media, including India and other parts of the world, people think of the fatwa as a violent act or as an imprimatur to commit a violent act or as a command to commit a violent act. That is not how millions, if not billions of Muslims uh, view the idea of the fatwa. So that has to be corrected. The word fatwa comes from the Arabic root FTY whose meanings include youth, newness, clarification, explanation. Its origin can be traced to the Quran. Fatwas have played three important roles in the pre-modern era. These are providing legal advice to the Muslim population as well as counseling them, advising courts of law on finer points of Islamic laws, elaborating substantive Islamic laws and integrating them into books. A fatwa is generally understood as an Islamic legal opinion, but according to experts, it does not transform into law in Islam. No, a fatwa doesn't become part of law. A fatwa is a voluntary statement, is a voluntary action that someone, someone issues a, a opinion. A fatwa is basically a learned opinion on a topic. It has no force. Only the person who has solicited the fatwa, so for instance, you've asked me a question of a fatwa, can Muslims, for instance, do organ transplantation. I would give you the answer to that, and you might agree with it and follow my opinion, or you might disagree with me and go and seek a fatwa somewhere else. So on the question of organ transplantation, for instance, Muslims the world over are in disagreement. Some people say, yes, organ transplantation is acceptable. Um, some would say that if there's a donor, it's much more easy, but if you take it from a cadaver, that is from a dead person, then some people will say yes and some people will say no. But the, it's a consumer of the fatwa who decides whether he or she is going to follow it. So a fatwa is not a law. A fatwa is an opinion. Now, unfortunately, in the case of Salman Rushdie 33 years ago, the head of the Islamic State, with the authority that he had, Create, issued that order, and that obviously had major ramifications, and it had diplomatic and other kinds of international relations consequences uh, that Iran got involved in in that imbroglio 33 years ago. But what has happened most recently to Salman Rushdie, uh, we don't know what the motivations of that individual was. We can make certain assumptions that many people are making. Uh, or that he disagrees with that person, whatever he said, but it doesn't justify the violence meted out to uh, Salman Rushdie at all. Fatwas are not binding in nature, but the fatwa against Salman Rushdie has a complicated history. It came from the then Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who passed away just four months after issuing the fatwa. Could it be revoked? This question about the death penalty for blaspheming the Prophet went back to Islamic imperial times when some scholars argued that someone who offends the prophet should be killed because the prophet was seen as the symbol of the Islamic order. But that was the opinion of some scholars. There was never a universal consensus on this matter. And I believe that this is an issue that Muslim religious leaders, theologians and muftis and others 
have to revisit in order to find the best solutions for our time. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, I believe that very few Muslim religious leaders are addressing this issues, this issue and this topic in a responsible and in a comprehensive uh, and, and, and a proper manner. Over the years, the way a fatwa is issued has changed. You can obtain a fatwa online via the internet. Uh, fatwas are disseminated via social media, via Twitter, via Facebook, um, via Telegram. Um, in fact, there are radio shows and television shows uh, in states such as Egypt where callers can call in and request a fatwa uh, from a, a mufti there uh, on, on stage. The fatwa against Rushdie is possibly one of the most well-known in the world. Ironically, before he was attacked, Rushdie was about to lead a discussion about the role of the United States as a haven for exiled writers and those under the threat of persecution. The literary world has reacted to the attack with shock and horror, but many believe it won't deter Rushdie's spirit. They say the power of the pen will give a befitting reply to all those who are justifying it. We are planning to have a, a, a panel discussion and a symposium in September. One of our speakers is Mr. Salman Rushdie. And so first thing was just really feelings of um, uh, just fear and also concern for my role as a cultural presenter, uh, how to protect the writers and the speakers that we're bringing and how um, he for so many years has been just kind of operating um, as I think as you would say without fear that because if uh, you let fear win you don't um, then the other people win the those who are interested in censoring you. I think that what Simon has said himself in the last few years about the need to live freely um, and that that is the best answer to terrorism and, and, and the threat of terrorism you know even if we're afraid to still be courageous, go about our lives, go about our lives in a free society, openly, democratically, speaking, thinking, you know, talking, uh, discussing, arguing and living our lives is still the best response that we can possibly make to those people who want to close down society, silence dissent, silence criticism. Mm -hmm.